Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ireland. It's great to see so many of you here today, and I'm delighted that you have decided to join us here at the Castle Hotel for our special Food Lovers Weekend. Before I tell you about the main events we have planned for you, I'd just like to point out that tea and coffee and biscuits are available at the back of the room, so please help yourselves. So, the weekend's events start straight after lunch, which you can take either in the main restaurant to my right or in the garden terrace, which you'll find to the right of the main reception desk. This afternoon, we are very excited to welcome local chef Laura Gallagher to the Castle Hotel. Laura will be showing you some typically Irish ingredients, many from her own garden, and explaining how good food needn't cost a fortune. She's also going to demonstrate a few famous Irish dishes, including Irish stew. As you may know, Laura runs her own award-winning organic restaurant about ten miles from here, and I know a few of you are planning to eat there tomorrow night. I can highly recommend it. So those of you who have booked for this afternoon's session should gather in the demonstration kitchen, which is to the left of the main restaurant, by 1:45 p.m., so that we can get going promptly at 2 p.m. And I'm sorry, a few people have already asked me, but this session is now full. However, there are still places on the city bus tour which will be leaving the hotel at 1:45. This will take you to all the main sites, and there will be a chance to stop off at the Riverside Museum and Cafe later in the afternoon. The coach will return from the museum at 5 p.m. promptly. Please note that entrance to the museum is not included, so you will have to pay on the door. But we do have a special discount, so that will be eight euros fifty rather than the usual eleven euros seventy-five. Tonight we have our five-course seafood dinner in the main restaurant. Our head chef has really planned a treat for you. I've seen the menu and it looks fantastic. Please note that this is not at 7:30 as originally stated in your holiday itinerary, but at 8 p.m. There is a seating plan up in the main reception, so please check this before this evening, so you know where you're seated. Oh. And one other thing regarding food, I have already had a couple of special requests from allergy sufferers. So please do let me know as soon as possible if you have any special dietary requirements. After dinner, starting around 10 p.m., if you still have the energy, we have Irish folk singer James Corgan here to entertain you until the wee small hours. His family have been making Irish music for over two hundred years, and he will treat you to both traditional and modern folk songs. He plays no fewer than six different instruments, including the baran, a traditional drum, the tin whistle, and the Irish fiddle. Well worth staying up for. First of all, let me thank you all for coming to this public meeting to discuss the future of our town. Our first speaker is Shona Ferguson from Barford Town Council. Shona, thank you. First, I'll briefly give you some background information. Then I'll be asking you for your comments on developments in the town. Well, as you don't need me to tell you, Barford has changed a great deal in the last fifty years. These are some of the main changes. Fifty years ago. Buses linked virtually every part of the town and the neighbouring towns and villages. Most people used them frequently, but not now because the bus companies concentrate on just the routes that attract most passengers. So parts of the town are no longer served by buses. Even replacing old, uncomfortable buses with smart new ones has had little impact on passenger numbers. It's sometimes said that bus fares are too high, but in relation to average incomes, fares are not much higher than they were 50 years ago. Changes in the road network are affecting the town. The centre was recently closed to traffic on a trial basis, making it much safer for pedestrians. The impact of this is being measured. 
The new cycle paths separating bikes from cars in most main roads are being used far more than was expected, reducing traffic and improving air quality. And although the council's attempts to have a bypass constructed have failed, we haven't given up hope of persuading the government to change its mind. Shopping in the town centre has changed over the years. Many of us can remember when the town was crowded with people going shopping. Numbers have been falling for several years, despite efforts to attract shoppers, for instance by opening new car parks. Some people combine shopping with visits to the town's restaurants and cafes. Most shops are small, independent stores, which is good, but many people prefer to use supermarkets and department stores in nearby large towns as there are so few well-known chain stores here. Turning now to medical facilities. The town is served by family doctors in several medical practices, fewer than 50 years ago, but each catering for far more patients. Our hospital closed 15 years ago, which means journeys to other towns are unavoidable. On the other hand, there are more dentists than there used to be. Employment patterns have changed along with almost everything else. The number of schools and colleges has increased, making that the main employment sector. Services such as website design and accountancy have grown in importance and surprisingly perhaps, manufacturing hasn't seen the decline that has affected it in other parts of the country. Now I'll very quickly outline current plans for some of the town's facilities before asking for your comments. As you'll know if you regularly use the car park at the railway station, it's usually full. The railway company applied for permission to replace it with a multi-storey car park, but that was refused. Instead, the company has bought some adjoining land and this will be used to increase the number of parking spaces. The Grand, the old cinema in the High Street, will close at the end of the year and reopen on a different site. You've probably seen the building under construction. The plan is to have three screens with fewer seats rather than just the one large auditorium in the old cinema. I expect many of you shop in the indoor market. It's become more and more shabby looking and because of fears about safety, it was threatened with demolition. The good news is that it will close for six weeks to be made safe and redecorated and the improved building will open in July. Lots of people use the library, including school and college students who go there to study. The council has managed to secure funding to keep the library open later into the evening, twice a week. We would like to enlarge the building in the not too distant future, but this is by no means definite. There's no limit on access to the nature reserve on the edge of town, and this will continue to be the case. What will change, though, is that the council will no longer be in charge of the area. Instead, it will become the responsibility of a national body that administers most nature reserves in the country. OK, now let me ask... Good morning, this is Burnham Tourist Office, Martin speaking. Oh, hello. I saw a poster about free things to do in the area and it said people should phone you for information. I'm coming to Burnham with my husband and two children for a few days on June the 27th or possibly the 28th and I'd like some ideas for things to do on the 29th. Yes, of course. OK. Then let's start with a couple of events especially for children. The Art Gallery is holding an event called Family Welcome that day, when there are activities and trails to use throughout the gallery. That sounds interesting. What time does it start? The gallery opens at 10 and the Family Welcome event runs from 10.30 until 2 o'clock. The gallery stays open until 5 and several times during the day they're going to show a short film that the gallery has produced. It demonstrates how ceramics are made and there'll be equipment and materials for children to have a go themselves. Last time they ran the event, there was a film about painting, which went down very well with the children, and they're now working on one about sculpture. I like the sound of that. 
And what other events happen in Burnham? Well, do you all enjoy listening to music? Oh, yes. Well, there are several free concerts taking place at different times, one or two in the morning, the majority at lunchtime and a couple in the evening, and they range from pop music to Latin American. The Latin American could be fun. What time is that? It's being repeated several times in different places. They're performing in the Central Library at one o'clock, then at four it's in the City Museum, and in the evening at 7.30 there's a longer concert in the theatre. Right. I'll suggest that to the rest of the family. Something else you might be interested in is the boat race along the river. Oh, yes. Do tell me about that. The race starts at Offord Marina to the north of Burnham and goes as far as Summer Pool. The best place to watch it from is Charlesworth Bridge, though that does get rather crowded. And who's taking part? Well, local boat clubs, but the standard is very high. One of them came first in the West of England Regional Championship in May this year. It was the first time a team from Burnham has won. It means that next year they'll be representing the region in the National Championship. I've heard something about Paxton Nature Reserve. It's a good place for spotting unusual birds, isn't it? That's right, throughout the year. There is a lake there as well as a river, and they provide a very attractive habitat. So it's a good idea to bring binoculars if you have them. And just at the moment, you can see various flowers that are pretty unusual. The soil at Paxton isn't very common. They're looking good right now. Right. My husband will be particularly interested in that. And there's going to be a talk and slideshow about mushrooms, and you'll be able to go out and pick some afterwards and study the different varieties. Uh-huh. And is it possible for children to swim in the river? Yes. Part of it has been fenced off to make it safe for children to swim in. It's very shallow and there's a lifeguard on duty whenever it's open. The lake is too deep, so swimming isn't allowed there. OK, we must remember to bring their swimming things in case we go to Paxton. How long does it take to get there by car from Burnham? Mm, about 20 minutes, but parking is very limited, so it's usually much easier to go by bus. And it takes about the same time. Right. Well, I'll discuss the options with the rest of the family. Thanks very much for all your help. You're welcome. So, what I'm going to talk about to you today is something called ethnography. This is a type of research aimed at exploring the way human cultures work. It was first developed for use in anthropology, and it's also been used in sociology and communication studies. So, what's it got to do with business, you may ask? Well, businesses are finding that ethnography can offer them deeper insight into the possible needs of customers, either present or future, as well as providing valuable information about their attitudes towards existing products. And ethnography can also help companies to design new products or services that customers really want. Let's look at some examples of how ethnographic research works in business. One team of researchers did a project for a company manufacturing kitchen equipment. They watched how cooks used measuring cups to measure out things like sugar and flour. They saw that the cooks had to check and recheck the contents because although the measuring cups had numbers inside them, the cooks couldn't see these easily. So, a new design of cup was developed to overcome this problem, and it was a top seller. Another team of ethnographic researchers looked at how cell phones were used in Uganda, in Africa. They found that people who didn't have their own phones could pay to use the phones of local entrepreneurs. Because these customers paid in advance for their calls, they were eager to know how much time they'd spent on the call so far. So, the phone company designed phones for use globally with this added feature. Ethnographic research has also been carried out in computer companies. In one company, IT systems administrators were observed for several weeks. It was found that a large amount of their work 
involved communicating with colleagues in order to solve problems, but that they didn't have a standard way of exchanging information from spreadsheets and so on. So the team came up with an idea for software that would help them to do this. In another piece of research, a team observed and talked to nurses working in hospitals. This led to the recognition that the nurses needed to access the computer records of their patients, no matter where they were. This led to the development of a portable computer tablet that allowed the nurses to check records in locations throughout the hospital. Occasionally, research can be done even in environments where the researchers can't be present. For example, in one project done for an airline, respondents used their smartphones to record information during airline trips. In a study aiming at tracking the emotions of passengers during a flight. So, what makes studies like these different from ordinary research? Let's look at some of the general principles behind ethnographic research in business. First of all, the researcher has to be completely open-minded. He or she hasn't thought up a hypothesis to be tested, as is the case in other types of research. Instead, they wait for the participants in the research to inform them. As far as choosing the participants themselves is concerned, that's not really all that different from ordinary research. The criteria according to which the participants are chosen may be something as simple as the age bracket they fall into. Or the researchers may select them according to their income, or they might try to find a set of people who all use a particular product, for example. But it's absolutely crucial to recruit the right people as participants. As well as the criteria I've mentioned, they have to be comfortable talking about themselves and being watched as they go about their activities. Actually, most researchers say that people open up pretty easily, maybe because they're often in their own home or workplace. So, what makes this type of research special is that it's not just a matter of sending a questionnaire to the participants. Instead, the research is usually based on first-hand observation of what they are doing at the time. But that doesn't mean that the researcher never talks to the participants. However, unlike in traditional research, in this case, it's the participant rather than the researchers who decides what direction the interview will follow. This means that there's less likelihood of the researcher imposing his or her own ideas on the participant. But after they've said goodbye to their participants and got back to their office, the researcher's work. Isn't finished. Most researchers estimate that seventy to eighty percent of their time is spent not on the collecting of data, but on its analysis, looking at photos, listening to recordings, and transcribing them, and so on. The researchers may end up with hundreds of pages of notes, and to determine what's significant, they don't focus on the sensational things or the unusual things. Instead. They try to identify a pattern of some sort in all this data, and to discern the meaning behind it. This can result in some compelling insights that can, in turn, feed back to the whole. We've been discussing the factors the architect has to consider when designing domestic buildings. I'm going to move on now to consider the design of public buildings. And I'll illustrate this by referring to the new Taylor Concert Hall that's recently been completed here in the city. So, as with a domestic building, when designing a public building, an architect needs to consider the function of the building. For example, is it to be used primarily for entertainment, or for education, or for administration? The second thing the architect needs to think about is the context of the building. 
This includes its physical location, obviously, but it also includes the social meaning of the building, how it relates to the people it's built for. And finally, for important public buildings, the architect may also be looking for a central symbolic idea on which to base the design, a sort of metaphor for the building and the way in which it is used. Let's look at the new Taylor Concert Hall in relation to these ideas. The location chosen was a site in a run-down district that has been ignored in previous redevelopment plans. It was occupied by a factory that has been empty for some years. The whole area was some distance from the high-rise office blocks of the central business district and shopping centre, but it was only one kilometre from the ring road. The site itself was bordered to the north by a canal which had once been used by boats bringing in raw materials when the area was used for manufacturing. The architect chosen for the project was Tom Harrison. He found the main design challenge was the location of the site in an area that had no neighbouring buildings of any importance. To reflect the fact that the significance of the building in this quite run-down location was as yet unknown, he decided to create a building centred around the idea of a mystery, something whose meaning still has to be discovered. So, how was this reflected in the design of the building? Well, Harrison decided to create pedestrian access to the building and to make use of the presence of water on the site. As people approach the entrance, they therefore have to cross over a bridge. He wanted to give people a feeling of suspense as they see the building first from a distance and then close up. And the initial impression he wanted to create from the shape of the building as a whole was that of a box. The first side that people see the southern wall, is just a high, flat wall uninterrupted by any windows. <laughs> this might sound off-putting, but it supports Harrison's concept of the building, that the person approaching is intrigued and wonders what will be inside. And this flat wall also has another purpose. At night time, projectors are switched on and it functions as a huge screen onto which images are projected. The auditorium itself seats 1,500 people. The floors supported by 10 massive pads. These are constructed from rubber and so are able to absorb any vibrations from outside and prevent them from affecting the auditorium. The walls are made of several layers of honey-coloured wood all sourced from local beech trees. In order to improve the acoustic properties of the auditorium and to amplify the sound, they are not straight, they are curved. The acoustics are also adjustable according to the size of orchestra and the type of music being played. In order to achieve this, there are nine movable panels in the ceiling above the orchestra which are all individually motorised. And the walls also have curtains, which can be opened or closed to change the acoustics. The reaction of the public to the new building has generally been positive. However, the evaluation of some critics has been less enthusiastic. In spite of Harrison's efforts to use local materials, they criticise the style of the design as being international rather than local and say it doesn't reflect features of the landscape or society for which it is built. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the Information Roundup on your own local radio station. This is Larry Knowles talking to you this morning on Tuesday, the 25th of May. And the first item coming up is a reminder to you all out there about Canadian Clean Air Day, which is on June 6th. In case you weren't around for the last one, 
This is a chance for Canadians everywhere to focus on the problems of air pollution and to actually try to do something to help reduce the problem. How many Canadians do you think die annually because of air pollution? 2,000? 3,000? Well, the rate is a staggering 5,000 and it's likely to grow unless we do something. And it's this concern with your health that's the driving force behind the government campaign that is sponsoring Clean Air Day. So what causes air pollution in the first place? Well, the transportation sector accounts for 27% of all greenhouse gases produced in Canada. It's also the biggest source of that thick, polluted air from traffic fumes that we call smog. And it's the tiny particles and ground-level ozone in smog that are the main causes of health problems and even deaths across the country. Of course, it's worse in the big cities. But researchers have only recently realized that all you need are low levels of air pollution to seriously damage your health, so we're all at risk. So, what can we do to fight air pollution? Well, it should be pretty obvious by now that the way we get to and from work every day can have a big impact on the air we breathe. So the easiest action you can take on Clean Air Day is to accept what we call the commuter challenge and get to work on foot or by cycling for a change. If you have to use your car, try carpooling and share the drive, or better still, use public transit. If everyone tries this for just one day, you'll be amazed by the difference it can make to the air in our towns and cities. But there's more you can do to improve air quality. For example, you can plant trees. And if you don't have a garden, then you can do your bit in other ways. For instance, did you know that modern improved wood stoves can reduce wood smoke by as much as 80 to 90 percent? So you can make a big difference if you upgrade the appliances you use in your home. The government is also working hard on your behalf to clean up our air. Its priority is to reduce the emissions that cause smog and they have clear plans to get there. Last year, Canada and the United States agreed to reduce emissions on both sides of the border between the two countries, and they plan to reach their targets in the next few years. The government's also taking action to get cleaner fuels. It's already reduced the sulfur contained in gasoline, and it hopes to reach the reduction target for sulfur and diesel by next year. But the measures don't just focus on the motorist. The federal government's also working to reduce emissions from power plants and factories right across the provinces. You can find out all about government action and all the plans. Good, good morning and welcome to the museum. One with a remarkable range of exhibits which I'm sure you'll enjoy. My name's Greg and I'll tell you about the various collections as we go around. But before we go, let me just give you a taste of what we have here. Well, for one thing, we have a fine collection of 20th and 21st century paintings, many by very well-known artists. I'm sure you'll recognize several of the paintings. This is the gallery that attracts the largest number of visitors, so it's best to go in early in the day before the crowds arrive. Then there are the 19th century paintings. The museum was opened in the middle of that century, and several of the artists each donated one work to get the museum started, as it were. So they're of special interest to us. We feel closer to them than to other works. The Sculpture Gallery has a number of fine exhibits, but I'm afraid it's currently closed for refurbishment. You'll need to come back next year to see it properly, but a number of the sculptures have been moved to other parts of the museum. Around the World is a temporary exhibition, You've probably seen something about it on TV or in the newspapers. It's created a great deal of interest because it presents objects from every continent and many countries and provides information about their social context, why they were made, who for, and so on. Then there's the collection of coins. This is what you might call a focused specialist collection 
because all the coins come from this country and were produced between 2,000 and 1,000 years ago. And many of them were discovered by ordinary people digging their gardens and donated to the museum. All our porcelain and glass was left to the museum by its founder when he died in 1878, and in the terms of his will, we're not allowed to add anything to that collection. He believed it was perfect in itself, and we don't see any reason to disagree. Hey, that was something about the collections, and now here's some more practical information, in case you need it. Most of the museum facilities are downstairs in the basement, so you go down the stairs here. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, you'll find yourself in a sitting area with comfortable chairs and sofas where you can have a rest before continuing your exploration of the museum. We have a very good restaurant which serves excellent food all day in a relaxing atmosphere. To reach it, when you get to the bottom of the stairs, go straight ahead to the far side of the sitting area, then turn right into the corridor. You'll see the door of the restaurant facing you. If you just want a snack, or if you'd like to eat somewhere with facilities for children, we also have a cafe. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, you'll need to go straight ahead, turn right into the corridor, and the cafe is immediately on the right. And talking about children, there are baby changing facilities downstairs. Cross the sitting area, continue straight ahead along the corridor on the left, and you and your baby will find the facilities on the left-hand side. The cloakroom, where you should leave coats, umbrellas, and any large bags, is on the left-hand side of the sitting area. It's through the last door before you come to the corridor. There are toilets on every floor, but in the basement, they're the first rooms on the left when you get down there. Okay. Now, if you've got anything to leave in the cloakroom, please do that now, and then we'll start our tour. Welcome to the Fiddy Working Heritage Farm. This open-air museum gives you the experience of agriculture and rural life in the English countryside at the end of the 19th century. So you'll see a typical farm of that period, and like me, all the staff are dressed in clothes of that time. I must give you some advice and safety tips before we go any further. As it's a working farm, please don't frighten or injure the animals. We have a lot here, and many of them are breeds that are now quite rare. And do stay at a safe distance from the tools. Some of them have sharp points, which can be pretty dangerous, so please don't touch them. We don't want any accidents, do we? The ground is very uneven, and you might slip if you're wearing sandals, so I'm glad to see you're all wearing shoes. We always advise people to do that. Now, children of all ages are very welcome here, and usually even very young children love the ducks and lambs, so do bring them along next time you come. I don't think any of you have brought dogs with you, but in case you have, I'm afraid they'll have to stay in the car park unless they're guide dogs. I'm sure you'll understand that they could cause a lot of problems on a farm. Now let me give you some idea of the layout of the farm. The building where you bought your tickets is the new barn immediately to your right, and we're now at the beginning of the main path to the farmland, and of course the car park is on your left. The scarecrow you can see in the car park in the corner beside the main path is a traditional figure for keeping the birds away from crops, but our scarecrow is a permanent sculpture. It's taller than a human being, so you can see it from quite a distance. If you look ahead of you, you'll see a maze. It's opposite the new barn, beside the side path that branches off to the right, 
just over there. The maze is made out of hedges which are too tall for young children to see over them, but it's quite small so you can't get lost in it. Now can you see the bridge crossing the fish pool further up the main path? If you want to go to the cafe, go towards the bridge and turn right just before it. Walk along the side path and the cafes on the first bend you come to. The building was originally the schoolhouse and it's well over a hundred years old. As you may know, we run skills workshops here where you can learn traditional crafts like woodwork and basket making. You can see examples of the work and talk to someone about the courses in the Black Barn. If you take the side path to the right, here, just by the new barn, you'll come to the Black Barn, just where the path first bends. Now, I mustn't forget to tell you about picnicking, as I can see some of you have brought your lunch with you. You can picnic in the field, though do clear up behind you, of course. Or if you'd prefer a covered picnic area, there's one near the farmyard, just after you cross the bridge. There's a covered picnic spot on the right. And the last thing to mention is Fiddy House itself. From here you can cross the bridge, then walk along the footpath through the field to the left of the farmyard. That goes to the house, and it'll give you a lovely view of it. It's certainly worth a few photographs, but as it's a private home, I'm afraid you can't go inside. Right, well, if you're all ready, we'll set off on our tour of the farm. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition, statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle class and upper middle class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, if smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten 
were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular size classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade. And then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes. And it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three. But in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive, with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began. And it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools. But it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee project, with students making gains that are statistically significant and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some. When we look at theories of education and learning, we see a constant shifting of views as established theories are questioned and refined or even replaced. And we can see this very clearly in the way that attitudes towards bilingualism have changed. Let's start with a definition of bilingualism. And for our purposes today, we can say it's the ability to communicate with the same degree of proficiency in at least two languages. Now, in practical terms, this might seem like a good thing, something we'd all like to be able to do. However, early research done with children in the USA in fact suggested that being bilingual interfered in some way with learning and with the development of their mental processes. And so in those days, bilingualism was regarded as something to be avoided. And parents were encouraged to bring their children up as monolingual, just speaking one language. But this research, which took place in the early part of the 20th century, is now regarded as unsound for various reasons mainly because it didn't take into account other factors, such as the children's social and economic backgrounds. Now, in our last lecture, we were looking at some of the research that's been done into the way children learn, into their cognitive development. And in fact, we believe now that the relationship between bilingualism and cognitive development is actually a positive one. It turns out that cognitive skills such as problem solving, which don't seem at first glance to have anything to do with how many languages you speak, are better among bilingual children than monolingual ones. And quite recently, there's been some very interesting work done by Ellen Bialystok at York University in Canada. She's been doing various studies on the effects of bilingualism, and her findings provide some evidence that they might apply to adults as well 
They are not just restricted to children. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well, Dr. Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when the square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if the square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the result of the experiment suggests that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr. Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age, which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two languages may prevent some of the negative effects of ageing. So that's a very different story from the early research. So what are the implications of this for education? That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear someone talking about a colour exhibition. Now, I'd like to welcome onto our show today Darren Whitlock, who's going to tell us about a very vibrant exhibition. Thanks, Melanie. Yes, in fact, it's an exhibition called Eye for Colour. It's packed with hands-on exhibits and interactive displays, and it explores the endless ways in which colour shapes our world. Now, there are 40 exhibits altogether that come under six main sections. Sadly, I haven't got time to tell you about them all today, so let me just give you a taste of what's on offer. So, to start off, there's a section simply entitled Seeing Colour, which is, well, as the title suggests, about how we do just that. And it's a good starting point, because basically you look at the museum gallery through a giant eyeball that's standing on a circular foot. 
What you don't know is that this houses a 32-inch camera and screen, and the overall effect of these is quite amazing. Another section that's very interesting is called Colour in Culture. Here, there are a number of activities designed to illustrate the powerful links that exist between colour and certain aspects of our lifestyle. And this is done through a range of images and objects. You can visit the colour cafe that contains meals that really make you question how conditioned you are. How hungry do you feel if you're faced with a plate of pink and green fried eggs and blue sausages, for example? This section also includes activities that give visitors some idea of what it's like to view the world with a visual disability, which is something that many people have to do. Then there's a colour in nature section, designed to illustrate the many amazing colours that we see everywhere around us, from rainbows to autumn leaves, and to give us an idea of what it's like surviving in the external environment. So, you can try camouflaging yourself. This really is one for the kids, dressing up in a suit and then selecting a background where, to all intents and purposes, you disappear. And you can look at the world through the eyes of a dog or fish. What do these creatures really see? I'd recommend ending the trip with a visit to the Mood Room, which explores the influence of colour on the way we feel. Here, you can lie back and listen to music as a projector subtly alters the lighting in the room, and with it, the atmosphere. How does each colour affect your emotions? You'll be surprised. While the exhibition's been running, the organisers have carried out a study of the favourite colours of their younger visitors. Over 2,600 children have responded to this, and there were lots and lots of colours to choose from, so the scores weren't high for each individual colour, even if the colours were, like blue, of average popularity. Clearly, the bold colours were the winners. Though purple, which I would have expected to be a high scorer, had just 1.73% of the votes, unlike deep pink, which came next to top. In the middle ground, along with purple, which was still pretty popular compared to others, was lime green, the first shade of green to be anywhere near the top. One two-year-old commented that red was the only colour she knew, which is perhaps why that was more popular with children than anything else. Needless to say, all the tans and beiges came near the bottom. In fact, the lighter the colours, the less popular they were, even the light pinks. So, why did the kids go for these striking colours? As adults, it's all about clothes, what we think suits us or is fashionable. But these youngsters are looking outward more, and they go for colours that hit them, that they pick out over and above the rest. It's less to do with how they feel, whether it calms them down or whatever, and more about immediate impact. And, of course, there are associations with football that led a lot of both boys and girls to go for particular colours. In fact, more children seem to comment on this than anything else, whereas adults would be more likely to go for something worn by someone they really like. So, all in all, it says a lot about... One of the most anticipated art events in Christchurch is the charity art sale organised this year by Neil Curtis. Neil, tell us all about it. Well, Diane, this looks like being the biggest art sale yet, and the best thing about it is that the money raised will all go to charity. So what you probably want to know first is where it is. 
Well, the pictures will be on view all this week, most of them at the Star Gallery in the shopping mall. But we have so many pictures this year that we're also showing some in the cafe next door. So do drop in and see them any day between 9 and 5. Now, if you're interested in buying rather than just looking, and we hope a lot of you will be, the actual sale will take place on Thursday evening, with sales starting at 7.30. Refreshments will be available before the sale, starting at 6.30. We've got about 50 works by local artists showing a huge range of styles and media, and in a minute I'll tell you about some of them. You're probably also interested in what's going to happen to your money once you've handed it over. Well, all proceeds will go to support children who are disabled, both here in New Zealand and also in other countries. So you can find an original painting, support local talent and help these children all at the same time. Now, let me tell you a bit about some of the artists who have kindly agreed to donate their pictures to the charity art sale. One of them is Don Studley, who has a special interest in the art sale because his five-year-old daughter was born with a serious back problem. After an operation earlier this year, she's now doing fine, but Don says he wants to offer something to help other less fortunate children. Don is totally self-taught and says he's passionate about painting. His paintings depict some of our New Zealand birds in their natural habitat. One relative newcomer to New Zealand is James Chang, who came here from Taiwan nine years ago at the age of 56. Mr Chang had 13 exhibitions in Taiwan before he came to live here in Christchurch, so he's a well-established artist and art has been a lifelong passion for him. His paintings are certainly worth looking at. If you like abstract pictures with strong colour schemes, You'll love them. Natalie Stevens was born in New Zealand, but has exhibited in China, Australia and Spain. As well as being an artist, she's a website designer. She believes art should be universal, and her paintings use soft colours and a mixture of media. Most of her pictures are portraits, so watch out. Some of them may even be friends of yours. And then we have Christine Shin from Korea. Christine only started to learn English two years ago when she arrived in New Zealand, but she's been painting professionally for over 10 years, and she sure knows how to communicate strong messages through the universal language of art. She usually works from photographs and paints delicate watercolours, which combine traditional Asian influences with New Zealand landscapes giving a very special view of our local scenery. Well, that's all I have time to tell you now, but as well as these four, there are many other artists whose work will be on sale, so do come along on Thursday. We accept cheques, credit cards or cash. And remember, even if you don't buy a picture, you can always make a donation. There's been a great deal of interest lately in encouraging people to use bicycles instead of cars as a means of transport. But not everyone is confident about riding a bike at the best of times, let alone in the middle of a city like London. Jack Hayes is a professional trainer who works for a London-based company, City Cyclist, which provides cycle training for the public. What exactly does City Cyclist do, Jack? Well, our basic purpose is to promote cycling as a sustainable form of transport. We believe the best way to promote cycling is to teach people to use their bikes safely and with confidence. In European countries, people all learn from their parents, and they also learned in school. And when I tell them I teach people to ride bikes, they laugh. They think it's crazy. But here in London, it's completely different. You're approaching the point where a whole generation of people have grown up not being allowed by their parents to cycle because it was considered to be getting too dangerous. And so, in turn, they can't teach their children. We believe in realistic training. So, if someone wants to use a bike regularly, say to get to work or school, 
We aim to train them by teaching them to ride on the actual roads they'll use, so they can develop the basic skills they need and build up their confidence that way. As City Cyclists, we believe cycling's for everyone, no matter what age or level of ability or mobility. We do complete beginners and also advanced courses. That's for urban cyclists who want to deal with things like riding in streets with complicated intersections and things like that. We don't promote the use of personal protective equipment for cyclists, and we endorse the policy of the European Cyclists Federation that parents should be allowed to make an informed choice as to whether or not their child wears a helmet. We believe the key to safe cycling is assertiveness, taking your place on the road. This has to be instilled right from the beginning. Assertive road positioning and behavior is the key to safe cycling in congested urban environments. Some people are surprised that we don't promote the segregation of cyclists from motorized traffic, but we don't think that's practical in all urban environments. Instead, we teach people to use as much road space as they need to travel safely and effectively. Now, as well as courses for individuals, City Cyclist provides a number of services for organizations. For example, we can deliver fun, safe cycle training activities at schools, arranging courses so that the disruption of curriculum time is kept to a minimum. As well as this, in order to promote safe cycling, we have provided training courses for employees and staff of local councils. And we are also increasingly looking at developing training courses in companies in order to help employers work towards green transport plans by helping to increase the number of staff cycling to work. Right, so that's a brief summary of what we do. If any listeners would like to find out more about the organization, you can have a look at our website. That's City Cyclist. C-I-T-I -I, Cyclist. .co.uk. And in order to book lessons, you can either phone us on 020-7562-4028 or do it online. There's an application form on our website, and you can just download that and send it in. We charge £27.50 per hour for one-to-one -one lessons, plus £6 for each extra person. So you're looking at just £39.50 for a family of three, say. If you've never been on a bike in your life before, we reckon we can get you riding in one hour. And for most people, a course of road training usually takes three hours. But whether you're a parent or a child, an individual or an institution, we'll be happy to discuss your special needs and make a program just for you. In the last lecture, we looked at the adverse effects of desert dust on global climate. Today, we're going to examine more closely what causes dust storms and what other effects they can have. As you know, dust storms have always been a feature of desert climates, but what we want to focus on today is the extent to which human activity is causing them. And it's this trend that I want to look at, because it has wide-ranging implications. So. What are these human activities? Well, there are two main types that affect the wind erosion process and thus the frequency of dust storms. There are activities that break up naturally wind-resistant surfaces, such as off-road vehicle use and construction. And there are those that remove protective vegetation cover from soils, for example, mainly farming and drainage. In many cases, the two effects occur simultaneously, which adds to the problem. Let's look at some real examples and see what I'm talking about. Perhaps the best known example of agricultural impact on desert dust is the creation of the USA's Dust Bowl in the 1930s. The dramatic rise in the number of dust storms during the latter part of that decade was the result of farmers mismanaging their land. In fact, choking dust storms became so commonplace that the decade became known as the Dirty Thirties. Researchers observed a similar but more prolonged 
increase in dustiness in West Africa between the 1960s and the 1980s, when the frequency of the storms rose to 80 a year, and the dust was so thick that visibility was reduced to a thousand meters. This was a hazard to pilots and road users. In places like Arizona, the most dangerous dust clouds are those generated by dry thunderstorms. Here, this type of storm is so common that the problem inspired officials to develop an alert system to warn people of oncoming thunderstorms. When this dust is deposited, it causes all sorts of problems for machine operators. It can penetrate the smallest nooks and crannies and play havoc with the way things operate because most of the dust is made up of quartz, which is very hard. Another example. The concentration of dust originating from the Sahara has risen steadily since the mid-1960s. This increase in wind erosion has coincided with a prolonged drought which has gripped the Sahara's southern fringe. Drought is commonly associated with an increase in dust raising activity, but it's actually caused by low rainfall which results in vegetation dying off. One of the foremost examples of modern human-induced environmental degradation is the drying up of the Aral Sea in Central Asia. Its ecological demise dates from the 1950s, when intensive irrigation began in the then Central Asian republics of the USSR. This produced a dramatic decline in the volume of water entering the sea from its two major tributaries. In 1960, the Aral Sea was the fourth largest lake in the world, but since that time it has lost two-thirds of its volume. Its surface area has halved, and its water level has dropped by more than 216 meters. A knock-on effect of this ecological disaster has been the release of significant new sources of wind-blown material as the water level has dropped. And the problems don't stop there. The salinity of the lake has increased so that it is now virtually the same as seawater. This means that the material that is blown from the dry bed of the Aral Sea is highly saline. Scientists believe it is adversely affecting crops around the sea because salts are toxic to plants. This shows that dust storms have numerous consequences beyond their effects on climate, both for the workings of environmental systems and for people living in drylands.